So let's bring up uh, Steve Faulkner. He's going to give a talk tonight. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, like I said, my name is Steve. Um, thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. It's cold and snowy and Thanksgiving and all those things, so I really actually do appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate being guinea pigs because I have never given this talk before and I have no idea how it's going to go. So, uh, we'll see. If you've seen me talk before, this might be a little bit uh, more soft touch, a little less technical. But don't worry, I will show off code. So, don't, don't get too sad. Like I said, my name is Steve. Um, if you see me online, you can find me at South Pole Steve on Twitter, on GitHub, on pretty much anything. That is my thing. Um, I, I've been done a bad job of explaining this in the past, so somebody actually, the last time I talked, asked me to kind of uh, insert more um, about why I'm South Pole Steve. This is me at the South Pole. Um, this is my picture online too, so this is the other problem I have is I, I go to meetups and meet people and people see me and they have no idea who I am because this is what I look like online. Um, that's my own fault. Um, but, so somebody actually asked that I like include a little bit about like why I went to the South Pole. So, you get a little, little sidetracked. Um, this is the South Pole. This is why I went down there. There's a project here on campus called Ice Cube that I worked for when I was an undergrad uh, as an engineering student. It was basically embedding a massive underground High, part or high energy particle accelerator underneath the ice. They're actually dropping these things. To give you perspective, that's about yay big. Um, uh, several thousand of these in the ground. Each one of these is like a little one pixel on a camera, and they're watching super high energy neutrinos go through the ice. So that's what I was down there for. I actually have no idea how the physics of this work. I just help drill big holes in the ice. That's, I'm an engineer. By trade, that's what I learned how to do. Um, okay, so back, back to the talk. Um, so the the original title of this talk was Class Developer Has Many Opinions, and because um, I thought it was kind of cute and funny. Um, and when we, I first talked to Zach about it, I was like, well, Rails has lots of opinions. Ruby has lots of opinions. We're all kind of running around saying this is the way you should or should not do things. So let, let's talk about it. Let's try to work through some of those opinions, maybe see what we can figure out, maybe get some uh, opinions about opinions. Um, so that's kind of maybe an alternate title, or meta opinions, or Meta opinions. Um, so, spoiler alert. Um, the I think the theme of this talk is opinions are not facts, and I realized like after I wrote this slide that that's actually a fact. So, yeah. um, but uh, I think I'm going to try to show you guys tonight that we spend a lot of time talking about how you should or should not do things when really there's lots of different ways to do things, and you should be accepting of that. Um, so. The first thing I'm going to talk about is opinions on uh, programs. So, um, I think one of the most striking examples that I've ever come across is like right when you install Rails, you get Haml versus ERB, right? Like a ton of people use Haml, and ERB is what comes with Rails by default. Um, I know this was like a big barrier for me when I first started learning Rails. Everybody's like, well, okay, yeah, that's what comes with the framework, but nobody uses that, uses other thing. And I was like, okay, you know, what does that mean? Um, and then, Brad actually kind of uh, pointed out to me the other day that there's a third competitor in here that a lot of people use too called Slim. Um, that's an even different, more different syntax for um, how to do markup in Rails. Right? I assume everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, so I kind of was like going through some of these opinions, and, and this is one I think that particularly I was able to, you know, find a good place to to fall down on. I really like Hamel. Um, but I read this blog post um, maybe about a year ago uh, called like Hamel for content, like don't use Hamel for content. This is a link to the blog post. I'll have these online later so you can actually see where these posts are. I got a bunch of links in here. Um, but Chris Epstein, the guy who wrote this, is a super smart guy, and it was he wrote it a long time ago too, three years ago. And he basically pointed out something that I had never really thought about. Um, and in retrospect, all the you know more front endy type people that I worked with were complaining about a lot is that Hamel sucks for content. Um, so this was was his opinion, and if you this is an example of using Hamel for content. So Hamel does weird things with spaces and commas and things like that. Anybody else run into this? Like, it's a huge pain in the butt. Yeah. All right. Some people know what I'm talking about. Well, if you haven't, then now you know. Um, so this is the same example of Markdown, like way more concise, way more way easier to understand. Um, so there's another uh, example that. Uh, you run a cross right away, and that's RSpec versus test unit. Everybody jumps into Rails, and they're like, okay, well, everybody, test unit is what comes with Rails, but everybody uses RSpec, so we use that, right? So you have to learn this new thing that 
is different than what you're given. Um, and this actually uh, recently became RSpec versus Minitest. So uh, the built-in test framework now is uh, Minitest, which is actually not too different from test units, so you don't need to panic too much. Um, but the truth is, this is actually like a, a pretty complex thing. So um, I kind of spent some time trying to like suss out, you know, like should you use RSpec, should you use Minitest, why? And then I didn't really come up with a good answer. The answer was you should check them both out and see what it's about. Um, Minitest, the newest version has some really cool things um, that are very different, but sorry, uh, that are behind the scenes very different from test units, so highly recommend giving it a look, seeing what it's all about. Um, so I'm going to just go over a couple other ones that people run into. Um, uploading files, like people have these strong opinions about which gems to use when uploading files, so paperclip versus carrier wave. Um, I think this, I picked this just as a, an example, I don't have an opinion on this necessarily, but um, in Rails we tend to have these kind of like old opinions and then the new hotness opinions, and I think this is a good example. So Paperclip um, was like the hotness for a while, right? And then all of a sudden Carrier Wave came along, and then Carrier Wave was like the new hotness. And so if you're uploading good stuff to file, or to file systems on servers, you can't use Paperclip more, you gotta use Carrier Wave, right? And it's like, and the truth is, is like they both work pretty awesome, you should check them both out. Um, Turbo, this is one of the, the newer ones that always kind of gets me is Turbo Links versus not turbo links. Um, so turbo links is something that shipped by, by default with Rail 4 and it seems to make a lot of people mad. Um, so that's kind of the end of that part of the talk. Um, I kind of originally thought I was going to talk about all of these different things about programs themselves and it turns out that you know there's lots of good information if you have questions about what to use you can check out these blog posts and you know there's not um, there's a lot of different answers so I really actually kind of started the talk that way, and I didn't have a lot of great content because I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to get up here and tell you what gem to use, and I don't know, I feel like that's not super interesting. So now we have opinions on how to write programs. Um, so this is another thing that I've come kind of across since I've been in Rails, which has now been maybe like three years. Um, so opinions on how to program, these are things like you should program this way, or you should write things this way, or you know, you should do testing this way. Um, so, I'm going to go over some of these. Uh, so the first example that I came across that, I, like a long time ago, um, maybe not a long time ago, but that really stuck out my mind is this thing called Sandy Metz's Rules, or that's what I'm calling it. Um, does anybody know what these are? Do people know what I'm talking about? Wow, I, I thought more people would know. All right. Well, I'm going to go over it, so you're in luck. Um, so this, this really awesome program out in California named Sandy Metz, she gives lots of talks and is, uh, she ever talked to Master Ruby? No, she's not. No. Okay. Get on that. She's very busy. <laughs> she, she's really cool. Um, she has a lot of content online. Um, and uh, maybe like, I don't know, six months or a year ago, these things came out kind of when we're making the rounds called Sandy Metz's Rules. Um, I think Thought, the ThoughtBot actually did a post that popularized, really got it super popular. There was some stuff on Ruby Rogues about it too. Um, so these are the rules. Okay. Uh, for program, no class can be longer than 100 lines of code. Okay. No method can be longer than five lines of code. You can pass no more than four parameters to a method, and you can't just make it one big hash. Um, this is a longer rule, so I just simplified it. Um, but basically, one request, one object. If you have a request coming in, it hits a controller method, you can only instantiate one instance variable in that controller. Um, oops, sorry. That's it, that's four, there's four rules. Okay. So um, when these came out, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I break all of those rules like every single day. Like, I must be a terrible programmer. <laughs> um, so it kind of bothered me for a while and then I just kind of forgot about it and, and didn't really worry about it. Until actually this talk, and I was like, okay, let's let's go back and revisit these rules, and let's try to figure out if I'm a terrible programmer or not, because I don't think I am, but it could be. So there's a gem that somebody wrote called Sandy Meter you can get <laughs> that actually figures out if you're a terrible programmer. Um, so I, it's really simple and, and does a great job. It even has HTML output, so you can like you know view this pretty picture of what your stuff looks like. So I started off, um, and I used this on some open source projects. So uh, Condon, does anybody know what Condon is? It's kind of newer, it's an open source chat app built on Rails that's meant to be deployed to Heroku, kind of like uh, HipChat or Campfire. Um, it's kind of, it, it works okay, it's still in development, but they seem to be still working on it. 
Uh, so I, I ran it on Kanban, and 66% of the methods are under five lines. So they break that rule a lot. And I was like, well, maybe they're just maybe they're terrible programmers. Um, so GitLab has been around for a lot longer. That's an open source version of GitHub that is on GitHub, um, and they break the controller rule. Um, well, 48% of the time. Um, so 42% of their controllers have one only one instance variable per action. Um, so that made me feel a lot better because like GitLab has a lot of kind of bigger contributors, and I was really surprised by. Um, the fact that they, they, have some, they break some other rules too, but this is like the most egregious example. Um, so then I actually ran it on, on my own code base that I work on pretty much every day, which is Murphy. I work for Murphy.com here in town. Um, and turns out we have 48% have of our controllers have instance variables one fraction. I was like super surprised. I was like, what? This is actually the worst example too. We, we don't do like anything worse than those other guys. Um, it, it kind of blew my mind, actually. I was sitting there, and I was all, all ready to get my butt handed to me. And I was like, wow, we're actually like not terrible. So I had a really low opinion of my own programming. Um, so I was kind of surprised. I was like, that's really cool. Um, and then I did some more research. So there's this other guy, Matt Amanetti. So he is also a guy that speaks at a lot of conferences and has lots of blog posts and talks about lots of cool stuff. Um, and he gave a talk at a conference that he wrote a blog post about that has a link to a video of the talk. It's very meta, but you can go to this link and you can check it out. And what he does is he gets up on stage and he spends the first like 20 minutes talking about there's no such thing as bad code. And then the last 20 minutes he invites um, Sandy Metz and somebody else, I can't remember her name, to come up on stage and talk about their opinions of bad code and good code and things like that. And Sandy Metz gets up there and it's funny because like up until this point, I really not heard the rules, Sandy Metz's rules from Sandy Metz. I always read other people's blog posts and other people's talking about them and things like that. And like literally the first thing that comes out of her mouth is like a five minute like epitaph on why her rules were made for this very, very specific purpose. Like she says, I had this one development team that was really terrible in San Francisco and they had no idea what they were doing and they needed to just totally rethink how they were doing stuff, and so this was like the only way I could get them to do it. And she basically says, like, I would never actually, like, you know, say these are like blanket rules. Everybody should use these rules all the time. Like, she goes and, like, totally qualifies them. Um, so, turns out, like, rules with an asterisk. Um, so, <laughs> I kind of, like, wanted to get into that. This talk is basically about me trying to write this talk and then, like, not being able to write this talk. Because <laughs> I, I started thinking like, oh, I'm gonna like write some stuff with Sandy Metz's rules and, and see how that's going. And um, Sorry, somebody's waving at me. I don't know who it was. Um, and, uh, and then I, I got to this point and I was kind of like, well, okay, the, it turns out that the rules weren't actually rules and, and it turns out I'm really not a terrible programmer, at least according to this metric. Um, so that, that kind of ended that. <laughs> okay, next topic. Um, so, there's this other thing out there that I, um, this is kind of a more advanced thing. Uh, Zach had specifically mentioned kind of getting into some more advanced topics at Matt Railers, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna pick one that's kind of like deep in the woods. Um, so this is styles of testing. Um, so people, the people who write these blog posts that talk about this stuff need to get their terminology straightened out. Some people call it classic versus Marcus testing. Um, some people call it status versus Marcus or classicist versus Marcus. I, all of those things kind of apply here. Um, but basically, it's, it's kind of two different ways to look at how we might um, do some unit tests. So I'm gonna go through an example and, and talk about my own experience. Um, I don't have a link to this, but the, the kind of, I don't know, like, uh, thing you wanna read on this is there's a, a blog post by um, Martin Fowler called, uh, I think it's called Stubs Are Not Knocks. This has like a whole background on how this whole thing works. Um, okay, so let's get look at this code, code time. Okay. Um, so this is a totally made up thing that we're gonna kind of look at uh, as an example. I tried to use my actual example of when I did this and it was just really complicated and didn't work. Um, and I actually, that's one of my own rules that I don't like. I hate when I go to talks and people use these like really fake made up examples. I'm like, show me some real code. Like show me some stuff you really worked on. If you want to see real code, you can look at it later. It just takes a little, it's too much if it's on the screen. Um, okay, so we have a kitchen, and we're gonna bake some cookies. 
Um, so I'm going to describe the bake method. Um, and this is how you might write the test for a bake method. All right, lots of different ways to do this, but this was, depending on who you talk to, maybe what somebody might call a status method, status uh, methodology, right? So we are going to create a new kitchen, because um, we can do that, which is cool. We're going to bake cookies, and then we expect the kitchen cookies count to be 12. All right, so it's checking the state of the object, right? Make sense? Everybody following me so far? Um, pretty simple. Some other stuff is probably going on in there, but we don't really know. We don't really care. We're just checking, like, make sure this worked. Um, so now we're going to talk about mockist. So it's not like statists don't use mocks or stubs. I mean, I did. It happens all the time. Um, but they kind of, I would say, my impression of mock us people, at least what I read about them, is that they take it to more of an extreme, right? We're going to mock out all of the stuff, all the dependency of this object. We're going to get really isolated with our unit test. Um, we're going to make sure that this isn't talking to anything it shouldn't be talking to. So in this case, um, in that before block, we might say, okay, kitchen.oven is oven.new. Um, this might be the, uh, this would have like just happened in the code without us knowing it before. So. Sorry, ignore this first line. Um, uh, and then uh, the next line on, we're going to say, OK, well, we don't want to deal with talking to the oven and what the oven does. So we're going to create a new test double, um, set that to the oven, and we're going to say it should receive preheat with 350. Okay. Um, so that's a very simple example. But usually what happens then is like, OK, we're going to do this to an extreme degree. right? We're going to um, mock all of these dependencies everywhere the object might leave itself. Um, so, so what happens then? I feel like my slides are out of order, but I'm going to find out. Uh, so this is the method inside oven. Right? We have a method inside oven called preheat that takes the temperature. Uh, well, and then something happened, and we needed to take options there. And we were like, OK, well, we're going to change that. And all of a sudden, we have this method that um, before it took an integer, and now it takes a hash. And all of a sudden, our test is actually we have uh, stuff baked into our test that doesn't represent what the object actually does. Um, it gets even worse if you change method names and things like that. Um, so there's actually a solution to this. Um, or there's several solutions. This is the one that I kind of like. There's this thing called RSpec Fire that actually makes sure that the things you're mocking out respond to the methods that you're mocking on them. Um, or they're subbing on them. Uh, so which it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you should check that out. I'm not really going to go into any detail about how, what that does, because that's kind of probably its whole own talk. Like, it's a kind of cool thing that's seriously complex. Try it out. Um, but so the thing I want to talk about is I actually tried to do this. So I, I, in my code at work, was trying to use more mocks and more stubs and, and be more aggressive about those kinds of things. But I said, look, let's really like embrace this 100%. Let's go crazy. So I made this thing called deploy button. Um, I actually sent it out to the Railers list, so maybe you've seen it before. It is a thing that lets you put a deploy to Heroku button on any GitHub repo. Um, so mostly thinking about the context of um, open source projects that you want to deploy to Heroku really quickly. Like I think our status is a good example. Um, Kanban is a good example. Um, GitLab you couldn't do. Uh, I think this one is sitting on. Um, uh, Joe Nelson, who used to live here and was a mad railer, he had a, a library that lets you get paid um, by anybody via Stripe through a website. Kind of just lets you throw a page up that says, here's my email, pay me some money. And so this allows you to deploy to Heroku just with one click. Um, so inside this app, I basically tried to take the kind of mockus approach to the extreme. I said, um, OK, anytime an object is talking to another object, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stub that out. Anytime an object is actually talking to another method inside that object, I'm going to stub it out. And even for private methods, I, I was like, literally everything is stubbed. The only possible thing you can do is talk to like what's between death and end, right? We're not going to like let you talk to any other method inside the entire object. I got really, really crazy with it. Like I, from what I've read, I wouldn't even say that um, hardcore mockers people do this. They like make exceptions and, and stuff. Um, so what's the verdict? Anyone want to guess? Like, did it suck? Was it awesome? <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, no, it, it was like, I, it's something I'd never done before. Um, 
there uh, was one side effect. This kind of gets into another thing, which is fast tests, but um, tests are really fast because basically you're just like mocking everything out all the time. You're testing these like really, really tiny pieces of functionality. Um, and it actually kind of forces you to write smaller methods. It forces you to kind of use some of Sandy's things. I found myself getting better at uh, taking classes and, and abstracting things out in new classes. And um, I'm like, oh, this is really complex. I don't really want to know how to mock this or test this. Well, it must mean I need a new class, right? So it, it kind of worked. Like, it was cool. Um, there's definitely examples in there. Uh, if you go look at the code, it's all open source where I kind of probably did it a little too extreme. But I mean, it's, it's would do again. Okay, um, now that section's done. Okay, so, so that, that was the one example of like something that I actually like got to do, and then I was like, oh, all right, all right. Like I, I got an opinion, like awesome, check. Um, so this one I, I really wanted to dive into, uh, and partially I didn't have time, but partially I, I found my answer too soon. So TDD versus BDD. Can anybody tell me the difference between TDD and BDD? I can TDD test driven development was too negative of a of a terminology. All right, don't don't spoil my talk, right? <laughs> All right, I already spoiled it. Okay, so this guy Dan North, he um, if you read stuff online, he said says he's the father of BDD. Like people say this, I don't know him. I have not read enough of this stuff to make a claim about that, but other people on the internet think so. Um, so he has a blog post called Introducing TDD that was published in like 2005 and it was published in a magazine too um, and in there uh, he actually says, or no, I think he said this at a conference later, but he said TDD is awesome so I tried removing the word um, test when I was coaching it and people seem to get it much quicker. Um, I think the truth is, is there actually is a difference between TDD and BDD, like it it's kind of has taken on its own thing. Um, I'm actually not going to get into that, but I just thought it was funny, like, this is something that I feel like I've heard a lot, like, people are like, oh, you're doing BDD, or you're doing TDD, and I was like, well, the guy who invented BDD said that he just basically wanted to change the word, <laughs> so, um, I thought that was kind of funny. Okay, so, how much time have I used, though? Have I got long enough? Okay, all right, yeah, all right. I got a little bit left. Um, so, this is a quote. I don't, I, won't, I don't want to make you guess, but does anybody know who said this? Probably nobody will know. You can have an opinion, but yours just happens to be wrong. My grandpa said this. Um, he's, I've heard him say this multiple times. So he's a, he's a very cool dude, but he's very strongly opinionated. Um, so I want to talk at the end about maybe opinions you shouldn't have or, or how not to have opinions. Because um, we kind of talked about some examples and we looked at some code. Um, so. I realize it's kind of meta, but I'm telling you when you're doing it wrong. But this is a bad opinion to have. <laughs> um, so I've heard people say this, like if you go Google, you're doing it wrong, Ruby, there's blog posts and there's Twitter article or Twitter tweets and all kinds of stuff, and it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, I think you should basically just remove this phrase from your uh, lexicon. It's pretty terrible. Um, it basically stands in for, you are doing it differently than how I would do it or um, you're doing it in a way that I don't understand. Uh, so, I mean, there's really not much else to say about it. Like, it's, I think there's no quicker way to like shut down a conversation and pretty much make somebody feel like an idiot. So, don't do it, don't say it. Um, you're not a real developer if. You don't TD, you don't use frameworks, you can't write SQL, you're not web scale, um, whatever those mean. Uh, this is, this is also something that I think you should probably remove from your lexicon. Um, and I think, I'm, sur I'm surprised by how often I hear this kind of stuff, especially like, um, I've heard some really, you know, big wig people like say stuff in conference talks I've watched that have been like, you know, you don't TDD and so you're not like a real developer. And I was like, what? And I, I think I heard that for the first time when I'd only been doing Rails for like, maybe like nine months, I was like, uh-oh, like, this is bad. <laughs> I'm never gonna be a real developer, I hate TDD. I kinda like TDD now, it's okay. Um, so, I think this is just something also to be aware of. This is also a, a bad opinion. Don't, don't have an opinion that says something like this. Um, I, I really hope, I don't know what my next slide is. It's 
we're going to find out. <laughs> Can you have too many opinions? It's kind of the last meta opinion question I'm going to ask. Does anybody think so? Anybody thinks it's bad to have too many opinions? Never. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's fact. I, I did a lot of research. I found out what happens when you have too many opinions. It's called Node.js. <laughs> Good thing! <laughs> okay, sorry, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I actually got to play around with Node um, over the last couple weeks. For uh, I played around with it before, but like more seriously for the first time. Um, Node itself is actually not terrible. It's not like the worst thing in the world. There's some cool things it does. Um, the things that are actually terrible are NPM. Like there's literally 30 packages for, you know, formatting URLs. It's like everything you want to do, there's a bazillion ways to do it, and half of them don't work, and you have to download the package and try it out. So that's terrible. Grunt, the Node build was kind of terrible. The documentation is terrible. Node itself, though, actually not terrible. So, um, all right, so, but that's kind of the end of the talk. Like I, I, like I said, I kind of started this talk thinking I was going to write about all these different opinions that Rails have, and we were going to look at all of them, but it kind of became more of a talk opinions about opinions about opinions, um, and maybe looking at some opinions you shouldn't have. Um, so yeah, I think the best way to get opinions, and, and I kind of tried to show it throughout the talk, is just try, try stuff, right? Like if somebody says, well, this is the way I do it, then uh, instead of being like, oh, well, they don't know what they're talking about, they're not a good programmer, uh, you should just go try it, and it, you know, you're like, maybe you'll end up being like, wow, like, Marcus stuff is kind of cool. Like, it, don't, it works okay. Like, that's not bad. Um, I have one parting thought to leave you with because this, uh, I said, just try it. This is my new slogan for my shoe company. Um, oh, and this is uh, actually, I think this is a, um, I wanted to bring up this because this was a, I was thinking about what to relate this to, like, in the real world. Because, like, in programming, we, um, I think we, it's also kind of ones and zeros that we tend to not think of it in terms of uh, real world analogs, right? So like, I, I think a good example I saw on Twitter today is somebody said, well, we ex we expect violinists to practice for hours, right? But we don't expect programmers to practice, right? Nobody's like, hey, I practice programming for three hours a day. Um, so this is an example from like working out. I was working out with a, a guy once and he was trying to tell me how to do an exercise. and. Uh, I had all this weight, and he's like, raise your kneecaps. And I was like, what? And I just like dropped all the weight, like, and I hit my foot, and it was terrible. Um, but like, you know, then when I actually tried to do the exercise, like the next time, and I was like, okay, let me think about it. This makes no sense, but I'm gonna think about raising my kneecaps. And I was like, he's like, you're doing it right. And I was like, there you go. So I think that, um, I don't know, that was just like a personal, <laughs> it made sense to me when I wrote that slide. <laughs> That, you know, it's something we don't do in programming probably enough. It's like, okay, I'm just going to try this just to see what it is, see what it's all about. Um, so parting thoughts. This is my actual parting thought. Um, JavaScript is terrible. Um, I, today was working on this problem, and I was just like, when I just could not figure it out. And I was like, looking at the code, and I'm like, this, this all should work. What, I don't know what's going on. Does anybody know what this evaluates to in JavaScript? What? No, this evaluates to true. All right. Um, so everybody, what this evaluates to in JavaScript? You can guess. Maybe. I don't know. False. I don't know. So array equality works in JavaScript, but only sometimes. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> questions? Yeah. Questions. Questions. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of the stuff I tried. Or, or counter opinions. Yeah. Anybody think I'm an idiot? I have one for you. Yeah. Everything in moderation, including moderation. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm all about the meta lately, so this is all very good. Um, yeah. I mean, you don't have to like speak up now, but feel free to like talk to me afterwards and let me know if this sucked. Like, I, one thing we get a lot of at Mad Railers lately is we've got a lot of like really you know gritty technical topics where like we're gonna configure servers and we're gonna do all this crazy stuff. And I, this is a little more soft touch. So I know. Uh, Kind of like the EmberJS. Um, have you tried some of the other ones? Yes, so I have tried Angular now, right? Um, so I, I mean, I'm guilty as some of the such as uh, some of the stuff as much as anybody is. Um, one thing I definitely like when Ember first came out, I was like, oh my gosh, Ember is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and uh, for a long time, I I had only really tried that. So I did um, end up writing an app in Backbone and then writing rewriting an Ember and deciding that I liked it way better than Backbone. 
Um, but uh, Angular, I never really, it, it took me a long time to give Angular like it's, it's full due. And so I tried some stuff in Angular. Um, the guys in town who are doing the Iconic Framework, um, their stuff is built on Angular, so if you want to go play with it, they got some cool stuff. So I got to try that a little bit, and um, I think they're actually, there's some cool stuff. I think it's actually perfect for Iconic. Like, if you want to build a framework, Angular is actually pretty awesome. Whereas Ember is a framework. They are trying to do all the stuff for you. Other questions? Shoot. When you presented the like Ruby libraries, it seemed like there were a lot of dichotomies. Like you can use RSpec or Minitest, or you can use Paperclip or Carrier Wave, and then like you can contrast that with NPM, where you might have like yeah, 30 different options or something. I was looking for like exactly compiling handlebar templates today, and it was just absurd how many options there were. Do you think that there's like a good middle ground? I mean, has Ruby like boiled it, boiled the middle ground down to two in a lot of cases? Well, I think the case with Ruby is actually you'll find there's a lot more going on there. Um, you know, I, I simplified a lot of it, or I picked the top two, but um, I think for any of those, you're going to find you know four or five gems that do some cool stuff and do it in different ways. Um, I know authentication is one that's like that. Like a lot of people use Devise. Um, almost that's kind of why I didn't put it up here because it's so widely used. There's not so much of a battle, but if you look. There's actually these great gems that do auth and do parts of stuff Devise do um, or do it in a different way. Uh, sorcery is one of them. I used Sorcery on a project once, and I was like, wow, like Sorcery is actually really cool. Um, or you can use Omni Auth without Devise. Like people have done that. Uh, so yeah, I actually um, I thought I had a slide in here about it. But that's actually one of the things I think is cool about Ruby and that I dig is that Ruby seems to have. You know, we have a lot of opinions, um, but a lot of them are strongly held. So we have people really defending them, which is good, because um, it results in good libraries that actually really work, um, versus, you know, like I said, the part of the, my trouble with Node was that, yeah, there's like 30 libraries to do one small thing, and half of them sort of work, and things like that. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm all for opinions, and I think it's, it's, I think the Rails community seems at a good place. Anybody else? How do you contrast this with, say, the, uh overbearing nature in something like Java where they have a standards committee and they say this is the way we do things because while Ruby doesn't give you a lot more freedom it also requires you to spend 10 extra hours evaluating all of your options versus just going in and writing whatever it was you set out to write. But we didn't have to write configuration files. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I, I don't really actually, I've like never actually written any Java so I don't have a, a lot to say there. Um, uh, I think that where you get that in Ruby, where you is, is you'll see people write frameworks, right? I mean, that's what Rails is. Rails is like, okay, well, yeah, you can go do these other things, but we're going to bundle this stuff by default, or um, we're going to make you use CoffeeScript, or we're going to you know, force you into using TurboLinks right out of the gate. And, and the nice thing is you can remove all those things really easily, too, but um, you know, that's, that's kind of where that stuff comes in. I don't know, I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of like an anarchist when it comes to those kinds of things. Like, I like to see the thrash, like, I think it's actually good that, like, Merb came out and, like, did its own thing and then merged with Rails and it's kind of like, you know, I mean, it, it, I think it's good, like, it forces us to not arrive at a local maximum, right, and we're kind of bouncing around and doing stuff like that. So, so it, um, it wasn't, one of the topics that you commented on, so maybe it's solved in Ruby, but a documentation style, spaces and tabs and indentation. Tabs. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, my opinion on those opinions are that I really don't care. <laughs> Um, like when people start getting into those kinds of things, it, tabs and spaces are one of the things that get brought up a lot because almost everybody knows it's a joke, right? Like, right. I mean, um, but but there is stuff like that where it's like, it, it really doesn't matter. Like, you can do it whatever way you want, and at the end of the day, like, it's not going to be that different. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything else to say about that. That's all I got. I, I have one addition there. If you do want to be the iron coder, though. <laughs> Cannot use tabs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually use spaces, yeah. Sorry. I just devil's advocate. Did you get Ubra? 
Oh yeah. Okay. I was outright told that I was almost disqualified. For that. <laughs> Apparently, some people. But some people don't like that. Yeah. Apparently, Ryan Davis has opinions. Well, yeah, I, I was going to guess it was Ryan Davis. So Ryan Davis, who wrote many tests, which I talked about earlier, he has a lot of opinions. So and some of them very strongly help. But I think, like I said, I think part of the reason that many tests is really good is because you know he said test unit's terrible, and I'm going to write a way better one. The first version of many tests was like 90 lines of code. I mean, it's it, it's really pretty impressive. By the way, I'll second that kind of raise your kneecaps mentality of like, you know, if you go figure something like this, like the, the quality of strings versus numbers is like weird in JavaScript, like go do it in five other languages. Yeah. Um, I started doing that recently with a bunch of different classes, like just defining basic classes and Objective-C and C-sharp. And then you go back to JavaScript and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, she's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> Else? All right, it wasn't really like 10 minutes, which I thought it might be a stuff. No, it was good. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing I would add is that one of the things I love, uh, I've been doing Ruby and Rails since like the mid 2000s. And it was like a, at least for me, after at the beginning, I just looked at it and I didn't understand what was going on. And I just used the scaffolding generator. And I crudded things, and then I said, "I want to use, um, I want to do users." So auth logic, sure. I don't know how it works. Just put it in there, and it'll go. And the day that I found myself like having an opinion about like, eh, I don't like Hamel. I like ERP, and then getting yelled at by people and having to defend that. That's when I knew I'd really made it as a Ruby developer. Was <laughs> when I had done it enough and. And one of the great things about Rails is it's easy to get started. It's easy to, you know, get off the ground and make things really fast. And the framework supports that. And then some. When then one day you'll come to work and have an opinion about something like a templating library, and that's when you know you're a professional Rails developer. <laughs> uh, you know you're an expert Rails developer if you then say, "I'm going to go write my own new one." So. <laughs> <laughs>